In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, thank you, Father Mullen, for asking me to come and preach this mission. And I entrust it to the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Mediatrix of all graces, that she will, through her mediation, enlighten each and every one of you and inflame your hearts with the love of God, the same love of God that burns in her immaculate heart. And so I chose for the four talks during this mission, uh, these four topics. The first will be on salvation. It is entitled, Save Your Soul, because this is what we must do. And the second talk is on sanctification, right? sanctifying our souls. And this is what we ought to do. The third talk is on our Blessed Mother, and the fourth on the Holy Eucharist, okay? because these two devotions to Our Lady and to our Lord in the Eucharist are the most efficacious means to obtain the first two, all right? So first, I want to talk about our eternal salvation. This time of Lent is a time of conversion, a time of penance, a time of prayer and reflection, and really a time of returning to the basics, the fundamentals in our spiritual life. Remember in the Gospel, our Lord talks about the seed that is thrown among the thorns, right? Now the seed grows up among the thorns and it is choked and suffocated. And those thorns represent the cares and the anxieties in the world, right? So now you all who live in the world need to be aware of this, okay? not to get too caught up in the world and to get forgetful of spiritual realities, of what you're really doing here in this world. All right, so the first conference brings us back to the, that most fundamental issue, that most fundamental truth that we must consider even every day of our lives. So I want to talk about first the importance of saving your soul, salvation. Now we read just in the reading for evening prayer, it says, is it likely that he would now fail to save us from God's anger? Right? We're preparing this time of Lent as preparation for Easter when we celebrate the redemption. Okay, that Jesus Christ has saved us. He has redeemed us. But what does that mean? It means he opened the gates of heaven that were closed to us. Okay? The gates of heaven are now open, but we must walk through them. We must do our part. We must save our soul. Jesus Christ has saved us, yes, but now we must save ourselves. And I will explain how we go about doing that. But this is the most important thing in the world. Our Lord says in the gospel, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and to lose his immortal soul? What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his immortal soul? And the reason why it doesn't profit to gain everything in the world at the cost of your soul is because everything in this world comes to an end and passes by. Death is at the end when all of the vanities of this world are done with, are finished, and then eternity. So what does it profit a man if he gain the whole world and be esteemed and held in honor by everyone and enjoy every day of his life until his death if he loses his soul? The person who is lost has lost everything. Heaven is everything, and it lasts forever. So he who loses heaven has lost everything and has lost it 
forever. Now we see, in light of this truth, the relative value of worldly goods. Okay, there's a real value in the goods of this world. God has created everything good, but that value is relative. Right? Even our own lives in this world, not an absolute value, right? At the cost of your soul. And that's why the martyrs were willing to give their lives because it didn't have an absolute value. But the salvation of their souls did. And that lasts forever. So the absolute value of heavenly goods, of eternal goods. Remember our Lord, what he says to Martha. Martha, Martha, you are concerned with many things, but only one thing is necessary. And so our Lord says the same thing to us. Okay, don't, we are concerned with many things in this world and many things that have their own importance. But there is only really one thing necessary. And that is that we save our souls, that in the end, we go to heaven. Now, there are consequences to this truth. The fact that our salvation is the most important thing in our lives. And the consequence is this, that it should have the top priority in our lives. And not just on Sunday, okay? Every day, the devil doesn't sleep. We need to be concerned about this most important thing every single day of our life. We don't know when God is going to call us out of this world to render an account. So it should be top priority. And now let's just reflect on a moment how few who live in this world actually have this as their top priority. And why is that? Well, the number one reason is a lack of faith. Okay, take the atheist, for example. For him, heaven doesn't exist. He's certainly not concerned about hell. And so why even give it consideration? And by the way, atheism is also on the rise here in America. Now, there's also the agnostic who finds it to be something uncertain. And so he doesn't bother thinking about it. But you see how unreasonable a position that is. I don't know if you've heard of Pascal's wager. Right? The agnostic isn't willing to affirm that there is life after death or that we are responsible to some higher being, but he's not willing to deny it either. He remains uncertain. And for many people, this passes as the most intellectually acceptable position. Well, we're not considered uh, devout fools, and yet we're not radicals like the atheists. Right? People don't want to um, be numbered among the extremists. And so many take this road, but we see how foolish and unreasonable that position is. Because if you have a doubt that heaven and hell exists, it stands to reason that you will do something to gain the one and avoid the other, just in case, just in case. Okay, this is Pascal's wager. It makes sense to um, make the gamble if you're uncertain. Okay, and that is live by God's commandments and pray, etc. We'll get to that. Now, another reason, okay, we've talked about the atheists, we've talked about the agnostics, is those who do have faith, many have little faith or an erroneous faith, right? Think about the great majority of Christians out there. What are they thinking with regard to salvation? There is the mindset that just about everyone is going to heaven, right? And how do you get there? You be a good person, right? That is the common mindset out there. And that is complete nonsense, especially when you think about uh, what do people mean when they talk about somebody being a good person? Okay, that word is thrown out there not in reference to observing the commandments, but in reference to how 
charming someone is. What a great personality. Nice person to be with. Okay? God couldn't care less whether you have an appealing personality or not. That has nothing to do with salvation. And yet this thought, this mindset is so pervasive, right? That you have to be a Hitler or a Stalin in order to merit eternal damnation. Total nonsense, because that is not what our Lord says in the gospel. What does he say? It was asked to him in no uncertain terms. Lord, will those who are saved be few? And what does our Lord answer? Strive to enter by the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Does anybody consider that today, our Lord's words? For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Now, I'm not going to tell you that the catechism teaches that the majority of human beings end up in hell. The catechism doesn't teach that. The church officially doesn't touch that question. But many saints and doctors of the church have touched that question. Okay? And the resounding majority interpret this phrase of our Lord in the common sense way. Okay? As St. Augustine says, the many are not the few, and the few are not the many. Okay? These are the saints and doctors of the church. Right? This retreat, or this um, mission, also applies to Father Mullen. Got some bad news for him. Because St. John Chrysostom, doctor of the church, says that even the majority of priests are damned. Okay? Yikes. Now he's St. John Chrysostom says this. Why? He says because of the seriousness okay, of the obligation and the duty that pertains to the priesthood and how few priests there are that respond to their vocation in a faithful manner. Right? So again, the gospel, the mission, applies to priests as well. We all need to save our souls. Priests, bishops, right up to the Holy Father. St. Paul says, work out your salvation and fear and trembling. St. Paul says that after having preached to others, what does he do? He chastises his own body. So that after having preached to others, he himself may not lose the prize. And we're all in it together. No one's excluded. So we all need to take seriously this fact of our salvation and not fall into this sin of presumption. Right? That's, that's really what it is and so widespread. Presuming that we will be saved without any merit on our own. That is a sin against the virtue of hope. The person who falls into presumption is hopeless. Right? They have sinned against the virtue of hope. Right? The virtue of hope, what is it? It says, my salvation is difficult, but not impossible. And that's hope. That's where hope lies. Virtue lies in the middle of the two extremes. So the two sins against hope are presumption, which says my salvation is guaranteed. I don't have to do anything. And the other extreme, despair. It's impossible, I can't do it. Okay. No, neither of those. We hope, okay, difficult, but not impossible. All right, so what does our salvation consist in? We know it's important. We know we need to strive. What does it consist in? How do we save our souls? All right, it all boils down to this. Dying in the state of grace. Grace in your soul. That grace that you received when you were baptized. 
Okay, that is, as the scripture says, the pledge of eternal life. If you have sanctifying grace in your soul at the moment of death, you are saved. If you die without sanctifying grace in your soul, you are eternally lost. All right, so what's the consequence of that? It means day to day, I am striving to maintain God's grace in my soul. Now, how does the baptized person lose that grace? Through mortal sin. Okay? Through mortal sin. That is the only way. By committing a serious sin, we know it's serious, grave matter, and we willingly do it. Okay? That is a mortal sin. Guess what? Missing Mass on Sunday through one's own negligence is a mortal sin. And here in America, we have 25% of Catholics going to Mass on Sunday. Many are called, few are chosen. Right? So, the grace of baptism. Now, if we happen to fall into mortal sin, we don't have to despair because our Lord knows our weakness. And for this reason, he instituted the sacrament of confession. By going to the priest, when our Lord said to the apostles, receive the Holy Spirit, he breathed on them. He said, receive the Holy Spirit. Whose sins you forgive, they are forgiven. Whose sins you retain, they are retained. Right? Now, the priest also is acting as a judge in the confessional, and he needs to determine whether the soul has the proper dispositions to receive God's forgiveness. That's why our Lord says, whose sins you do not forgive, they are retained. All right? So we need to avail ourselves of confession right? if we are in mortal sin. And really, very soon afterwards, let's not wait, you know, two weeks, a month, six months. You know, sometimes this happens. People wait a long time. What are they thinking? Right, if you had, um, uh, if your skin was starting to rot, okay, on your arm, would you wait around to go to the doctor? No. Well, mortal sin is much worse than that. It is the death of your soul. As the theologians call it, it is the antechamber to hell, right? It is the state of damnation in waiting, right? Now our God is merciful, but he, and he waits and, and for the sinner to convert. Remember in the gospel, it talks about the fig tree, which isn't bearing fruit, and the gardener intercedes and says, let me dig around it, you know, and take care of this and give me a year and let's see if it bears fruit. And if it doesn't bear fruit after a year, it will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Okay, so our Lord is patient with sinners. There's no doubt about it. Okay, there are all kinds of graces and mercies that are held out to sinners. But he doesn't wait forever. He doesn't wait forever. St. Alphonsus Liguori wrote a little tract about the specified number of sins. That is, that there is a number of sins that God is waiting for with regard to each and every habitual sinner, okay, the person who is in the state of mortal sin. There is a fixed number for that person. The person doesn't know what that number is. And when that number is up, God's patience is done, mercy is over. And then there is justice. We don't know when God is going to call us out of this life. I am sure that all of us are aware of someone out there, someone we knew who suffered an unforeseen death. Okay, a sudden unforeseen death. Right? And those people who suffered the sudden unforeseen death knew others before them. Right? They didn't think it would happen to them. And so we don't need to be presumptuous 
in this aspect either that is presumptuous of God's mercy, presuming that God is going to wait for our conversion, that we can put it off okay, for a later time. Now, we need to convert now. Again, one of the responsorials um, that we read during this time of Lent is, if today you hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Right? If today you hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Don't wait, but convert and be reconciled to God. Avail yourselves of his mercy in the confessional, that miracle that takes place, okay, bringing the soul from a state of mortal sin to the state of grace is a greater miracle than resurrecting the dead. All right. Why? Because the resurrection of the dead, there requires no cooperation of man's free will. All right. God works that miracle without man's free will. Lazarus, okay, he was told, commanded to come out of the tomb. Our Lord didn't ask him if he wanted to. But the soul in the state of grace must cooperate with his own free will okay, in order to be spiritually resurrected. He must desire God's mercy. He must be willing to change his life and abandon sin, to avoid the near occasions of sin, to use all of the means at that are available to him to remain in the state of grace. All of this is necessary. And that's why it is a greater miracle okay, for God to bring that soul from the state of mortal sin back to the state of grace. So I encourage you, I'll be hearing confessions all this week. I encourage you to come and receive this great gift of God's mercy and Tomorrow, we will be continuing on this spiritual journey, talking about sanctification. Right? Today was salvation, what we must do, the bare minimum, our obligation. Tomorrow is sanctification, really what we ought to be doing. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.